BBC News. Hello and welcome to Business Matters. I'm Mark Whitaker, and on the programme today, the amorous American suitor and the reluctant British bride. Pfizer's bid for AstraZeneca comes under fire from MPs in London. And scrubbing up or scrubbing out the details of your online history. Could a European court ruling be yet another can of virtual worms? Private companies, in effect, will be able to censor our past. For us, that's a deeply, deeply worrying development. My guests on the programme today are Jennifer Cheng, boss of the cosmetics firm Glamit. Jennifer is in Hong Kong. And Dan Marcus, who runs a company called Par FX. And Dan's in New York. And we'll be hearing from Jennifer and Dan in a moment or two. But we start today with a really quite desperate news from Western Turkey, where an explosion and a fire in a coal mine has killed more than 150 miners and trapped hundreds more underground. It's happened at a mine in Soma, which is around 120 kilometres from the Aegean coastal city of Izmir. Rescue workers have been pumping air into the mine to try to keep those still trapped by the fire alive. Meanwhile, thousands of people, fellow miners and family members, have massed outside the town's hospital where lines of police are holding them back. Enis Shermadem is from the BBC's Turkish service and he joins us now. Enis, already this is the worst mining yeah. disaster <laughs> Turkey has seen in years. How, how did it happen? Well, uh, it's certainly one of the worst uh, mining accidents that we have seen. It's very much a match for the shareholders as well. So I think those two last objective elements are sometimes getting sort of overwritten by the, the sentiment and subjective parts yeah. that uh, I mentioned before. Jennifer, do you think there are instances where national governments should be able to say, no, hands off, this company is so crucial to our country that we simply can't afford to let it be taken over by a foreign competitor? Um, I think, um, like uh, Dan just mentioned right now, it's a political hot potato. And it's $106 billion we're talking about here. It's a really aggressive op- offer, and there's a lot at stake. And, um, it's, I mean, as the stakes go up, it's, uh, it's very apparent that uh, AstraZeneca's board is going to have to uh, respond in some way. Um, I think that while the government and other parties need to be concerned, since there is so much at stake and so many people will be affected, um, the government shouldn't necessarily meddle with free market forces here and prevent the acquisition outright because uh, job losses alone um, aside, the free market is um, surprisingly efficient. Um, I think people and markets are surprisingly resilient with time and we all learn to adapt to worldwide business and consumer trends. So if you look at the jobs and workforce landscape in itself, as a society um, and as you know, if we look beyond borders, we've all gone through the industrial revolution, the communications age. And while we're seeing things uh, in the past and now, like outsourcing, contracting, temping, people haven't been replaced completely by computers and, and machines yet, right? Um, there's always a human element that you can't completely replace. And I think with any merger and acquisition, uh, it's only natural. I mean, it's a sad fact that um, jobs are both lost, but jobs are also created. Um, it's the nature of doing business. So So I think maybe instead of a heavy-handed regulation and attempts to delay the inevitable, there has to be some way for the government, maybe Pfizer, to cooperate and work together and make commitments to their past, current and future employees. The the problem with that, though, Dan, is isn't it that a company can make commitments and and then say a bit down the road, well, forget the commitments, we've got the company now. Well, again, that, that's the experience from Cabras and Craft. But um, I think here the, the statement is that we're making legally binding commitments. There really needs to be an analysis as to how legally binding those commitments actually are in reality. And to be fair, I mean, you've heard it. Pfizer is being sort of run through the ringer here. Uh, this is being heavily analysed by uh, the British public and the British government um, and uh, independent committees as well. So if this deal does go through, you certainly uh, would say that it's been run through the gamut. So it's not free and easy by any stretch of the imagination. So uh, mind-boggling. I can't see how those search engine companies simply will be able to handle uh, the level of potential requests from this. Essentially, the EU court is devolving to a private organisation, in other words, a Google, a Yahoo or Facebook, the decision-making process on whether or not information about private individuals, and that may or may not include public officials, is removed 
from searches. In other words, individuals will now have the opportunity to censor their past. And while we as Index absolutely support the importance of the right to privacy, I would argue that this sets us on a very slippery slope where all sorts of individuals, including politicians, might be able to effectively change or, or alter the way in which the past and history appears. That's Jody Ginsburg from the Index on Censorship. Uh, this is one I'm going to chuck at my guests today. Uh, Jennifer Chang in Hong Kong, first of all. This is quite a complex issue, isn't it? Striking a balance between privacy and freedom of information. It sure is. Um, I think, uh, I mean, this uh, this whole case here um, of Mario Costello Gonzalez, um, it, it, it sets a really important precedence for the right to our own information and to control our information. And I think to some extent, we should have the ability to control our past and our memories, um, what we put out there, our digital profiles. But um, even if you're really careful about what you put out there, it's you're, you'll still have you know youthful indiscretions. Maybe mm-hmm. like maybe yeah. uh, you, you're partying in college, and <laughs> should that necessarily come back to haunt you? I mean, it's a <laughs> that uh, I mentioned before. Jennifer, do you think there are instances where national governments should be able to say no, hands off? This company is so crucial to our country that we simply can't afford to let it be taken over by a foreign competitor. Um, I think, um, like uh, Dan just mentioned right now, it's a political hot potato. And it's $106 billion we're talking about here. It's a really aggressive off- offer, and there's a lot at stake. And, um, it's, I mean, as the stakes go up, it's, uh, it's very apparent that uh, AstraZeneca's board is going to have to uh, respond in some way. Um, I think that while the government and other parties need to be concerned, since there is so much at stake and so many people will be affected, um, the government shouldn't necessarily meddle with free market forces here and prevent the acquisition outright because uh, job losses alone um, aside, the free market is um, surprisingly efficient. Um, I think people and markets are surprisingly resilient with time and we all learn to adapt to worldwide business and consumer trends. So if you look at the jobs and workforce landscape in itself, as a society um, and as you know, we, we look beyond borders. We've all gone through the industrial revolution, the communications age, and while we're seeing things uh, in the past and now, like outsourcing, contracting, temping, people haven't been replaced completely by computers and, and machines yet, right? Um, there's always that human element that you can't completely replace. And I think with any merger and acquisition, uh, it's only natural. I mean, it's a sad fact that um, jobs are both lost, but jobs are also created. Um, it's the nature of doing business. So I think maybe instead of a heavy-handed regulation and attempts to delay the inevitable, there has to be some way for the government, maybe Pfizer, to cooperate and work together and make commitments to their past, current and future employees. The, and prob- the, to, the, the problem yeah. with that, though, Dan, is isn't it, that a company can make commitments and then, and then say uh, a bit down the road, well, forget the commitments, we've got the company now. Well, again, that, that's the experience from Cabras and Craft. But um, I think here... The, the statement is that we're making legally binding commitments. There really needs to be an analysis as to how legally binding those commitments actually are in reality. And to be fair, I mean, you've heard it, Pfizer is being sort of run through the ringer here. Uh, this is being heavily analysed by uh, the British public and the British government um, and uh, independent committees as well. So if this deal does go through, you certainly uh, would say that it's been run through the gamut. So it's not free and easy by any stretch of the imagination. So do you think then that MPs are playing to the gallery over this? If their hands are genuinely tied and there's not much they can do, are they just going through the motions? Unquestionably, this is a political play as well as a real play. So uh, I do think that uh, political merit is being made of taking a position which is very popular in the UK at the minute, which is protecting our borders. Uh, Hence all the support for the UK Independence Party coming up to European um, uh, European elections. So yes, um, I would agree that uh, there is um, political elements being made out of what, what is a deal that needs to be fully analysed to see for the benefits of um, global pharmaceuticals, I guess, and AstraZeneca as a whole, and uh, British jobs, etc. OK, Dan and Jennifer, for, for the meantime, uh, thanks very much. Now, has your past ever come back to haunt you? Well, in future, maybe it won't have to, because thanks to a ruling from the European Union's top court, that's the Court of Justice, it could be possible to take some things from your past, dark things you might not be that proud of, and make them simply 
melt away. The court's ruling follows the case of a Spanish citizen, one Mario Costeja. He searched his name on Google and he didn't like what he found, particularly a reference to an old debt. He went to a Spanish court to have the reference to his debt removed. The case went right to the top and resulted in the European Court of Justice ruling that individuals like Mr Costeja should have some control over the information which appears when their name is put onto an online search engine. Well, privacy campaigners say it's a victory. Anti-censorship groups are calling it a disaster. Google says the ruling is disappointing. Vivian Redding is the European Union's Justice Commissioner. This ruling underlines that data protection is a fundamental right for all citizens, that data belong to the individual and not to the companies, and that companies operating on the European territory, whatever their nationality, have to apply European law. So when somebody has said something about you personally, and this information is always popping out, even after 20 years, when this information is not accurate anymore, this should be taken away. Total recall, you could say. But what are the likely implications for online search engines like Google, Yahoo and uh, Bing? Jodie Ginsberg is, uh, is someone who campaigns against censorship. She's the chief executive of the lobby group Index on Censorship. It will have a massive impact on them just from a sheer logistical point of view. So in effect, what the EU court has ruled is that private companies, in effect, will be able to censor our past. For us, that's a deeply, deeply worrying development. And the sheer practicality of them being able to do that, I think, is uh, mind-boggling. I can't see how those search engine companies simply will be able to handle uh, the level of potential requests from this. Essentially, the EU court is devolving to a private organisation, in other words, a Google, a Yahoo or Facebook, the decision-making process on whether or not information about private individuals, and that may or may not include public officials, is removed from searches. In other words, individuals will now have the opportunity to censor their past. And while we as Index absolutely support the importance of the right to privacy, I would argue that this sets us on a very slippery slope where all sorts of individuals, including politicians, might be able to effectively change or or alter the way in which the past and history appears. That's Jodie Ginsberg from the Index on Censorship. Uh, This is one I'm going to chuck at my guests today. Uh, Jennifer Chang in Hong Kong, first of all. This is quite a complex issue, isn't it? Striking a balance between privacy and freedom of information. It sure is. Um, I think, uh, I mean, this uh, this whole case here um, of Mario Costello Gonzalez, um, it, it, it sets a really important precedence for the right to our own information and to control our information. And I think to some extent we should have the ability to control our past and our memories, um, what we put out there, our digital profiles. But um, even if you're really careful about what you put out there, uh, it's you're, you'll still have you know youthful indiscretions, indiscretions maybe mm-hmm. like maybe yeah. uh, you, you're partying in college, and <laughs> should that necessarily come back to haunt you? I mean, it's a question between uh, you know curation and outright censorship. And um, I think also when when I Google myself and uh, my friends Google themselves, there's sometimes information overload out there and misinformation, and sometimes the the indexing and the, and and the results are not even relevant or 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 outdated. I was going to say, so, are you talking from personal experience? <laughs> um, yeah, I, I, I am talking from personal experience and, uh, and I think there's a, there's other qu- uh, questions too. I mean, both as an individual but also as an employer or, uh, I mean, if you were to employ a caretaker um, of your child or pet, you'd probably want to know if they have you know, a, Yeah, a that's the background. point, isn't it? Yes, just, I, I'm still not sure what kind of information on the internet you could legitimately challenge. I mean, this Mr Costeja uh, objected to a reference to an old debt he'd had, but say, Dan, that you had a criminal record, should you be able to get any reference to that removed? And if so, when? How long would you have to wait? Yeah, um, very interesting. I mean, I, I maybe I'm showing my age here, but um, I come from uh, an era where uh, we had such a thing called privacy, um, that seems to have disappeared in recent years in the 